Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today my timing light isn't working. I was trying to time the ignition of my Carmen Ghia, but when I hooked it up, there was no light. This is a really high quality unit with a metal case, so I'd like to fix it rather than buy a new one. So why don't you join me while I try to fix the Sears timing light from the mid-1970s? I'd like to spend a moment on safety. There's nothing more important than keeping you and your loved ones safe. Be sure to read, understand, and follow the safety rules for your tools. Using your tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And always use the appropriate eye, hearing, and respiratory personal protective equipment. In this video, we'll be working with electrical charges of over 2,000 volts. That's enough to give you a nasty shock. So if you aren't comfortable working around these voltages, then don't. If you're following along, you're doing so at your own risk. Now let's get started. Timing lights are used to time automobile engine ignition systems that use a conventional distributor and points. Since that type of ignition system hasn't been used in new cars for years, my brother-in-law didn't have any use for his timing light. About 25 years ago, he gave it to me because I was working on classic Volkswagens. It's always worked fine until just now. This time there was no noise, no light, no nothing. Let's open it up. Inside, I removed the printed circuit board with a xenon flash bulb tube attached to one end and protected by a fiber insulating sleeve. The power leads, spark wire sensor, capacitor, and trigger switch are wired to the board. The first thing I do is look for any obvious open circuits or faulty connections. I also check several components with an ohmmeter. Unfortunately, I didn't find anything obvious. That means that I'll actually have to understand the circuit so I can troubleshoot it. Since I can't find a schematic, I'll wind up reverse engineering the circuit. I take pictures of both the component and foil sides of the circuit board. Then, in the graphics program GIMP, I flip the component side image and overlay the foil side image. This lets me easily follow and document the circuit while I draw the schematic. In order to develop a troubleshooting plan, we need to know how the circuit works. First, let's talk about the xenon flash tube. It is a small glass tube that's filled with xenon gas. It has two electrodes that are inserted into the gas path, the positive anode and the negative cathode. There is also a trigger wire that is wrapped around the glass tube near the cathode. Xenon, in its unexcited state, has very high resistance. A high voltage supply can be connected between the anode and cathode and no current will flow. However, when the xenon is excited with a very high voltage pulse on the trigger wire, the gas ionizes and its resistance drops. This allows high current to flow through the xenon tube while emitting a very bright white light. The supply is around 500 volts and the trigger pulse is 2000 volts or more. We can break our schematic into two major sections that work together to flash the xenon tube, the power supply and the trigger section. The power supply is a DC to DC converter that increases 12 volts DC to approximately 500 volts DC. The transistor Q1 makes up a high current, high frequency oscillator. The output drives the primary of a transformer that raises the voltage to 500 volts. This charges the capacitor that stores the energy for each xenon tube flash. 
The trigger circuit consists of a spark wire sensor, a silicon control rectifier, and a trigger transformer. When the spark wire sensor, which is an inductor coil that is clamped around the number one cylinder spark plug wire, senses a spark, a pulse is generated which fires the SCR. The output of the SCR is connected to the primary of the trigger transformer. This produces a very short, high voltage pulse which then triggers the xenon tube. The first thing I do is clean the printed circuit board. Early DC to DC converters are especially susceptible to dirt and contamination because that interferes with starting the oscillator. No oscillator, no power. Next, I connect my VTVM across the power capacitor. This meter is capable of measuring 1500 volts DC. Then I attach the power and pull the trigger and whoa, I didn't expect that. The tube fires and this does have signs of life. I try again and measure the voltage across the capacitor at 500 volts DC. I think I'm going to put this back together and see if it'll work on my car. I hook up the power leads to the battery and clip the spark plug sensor to the number one cylinder spark plug wire, making sure that the arrow on the sensor points toward the spark plug. I start the engine, point the light toward the timing marks, and pull the trigger. Success! I notice that the timing is off, so I turn the distributor slightly to align the timing marks with the marker on the case. Then I'm done. Thanks for joining me today. We troubleshot a reluctant vintage timing light and got it to work again. Along the way, we learned a little about how timing lights work and I was able to make a schematic that might help others. Now I can use this light to help chase down an overheating problem that I'm having with my Gia. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down and leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon.